episode of this Forum Chatter podcast. I'm Nachi Weinstein. This episode was recorded a while back, but I'm posting now as it is unfortunately appropriate because of the events in Amsterdam Thursday night where Jewish supporters of Maccabi Tel Aviv were attacked in Amsterdam following a soccer match, which is sadly ironic as Amsterdam was once the, the very city in Europe where the former Moranos slash Conversos went to escape the Inquisition and they were able to revert to being openly Jewish. And that's something you'll hear about more on this episode about the general history of the Jews in the Netherlands and Hopefully, I hope to do more in the future also about the Jewish community uh, in Amsterdam. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Gymnasium. Check out the beautiful catalog for Auction 19, the Taporovich collection, where they have Svarim, Silver, Judaica, manuscripts, and more. And you can also listen to the in-depth conversation I had on the podcast with Ramesh Maiman about the catalog. And there'll be a link in the show's notes below to check out the it's the previous podcast episode, as well as to check out the auction catalog. The auction will take place November 17th, 12 p.m. Eastern Time on gnazim.com, G-E-N-A-Z-Y-M. Um, you can subscribe to the WhatsApp chat where I post links to new svarim, new books, book deals, and so on. You can also, um, if you'd like to sponsor an episode of the podcast, you can email me, svarmchat.gmail.com, or check out the links and information in the show's notes below. And as always, if you can please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast. And with that, enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Svarm Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Professor Bart Vallette, who is the professor of Jewish history at the University of Amsterdam. And he is the uh, one of the editors or co-editors of the brand new uh, reissued book. It's really a new book called Reappraising the History of the Jews in the, Nether- in the Netherlands. And we will be discussing the book and in general, the history of the Jews in the Netherlands, Dutch Jewry as it is. So thank you, Professor Vallette, for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start off. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, so I'm a professor of uh, Jewish history at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, to be very precise, professor of early modern modern Jewish history, in particular of Amsterdam. Uh, and of course, that, that already says something about the focus of my um, my scholarly work, uh, which mostly deals with um, Amsterdam and uh, Dutch Jewry, uh, of course, in the broader context of uh, both Sephardic and Ashkenazi uh, uh, histories. Um, now I'm, I'm trained both as an historian uh, and in the field of Jewish uh, studies. Um, so uh, I, I did Hebrew and Yiddish and Aramaic. Um, uh, and for me, uh, uh, what I always try to do is, is to combine uh, uh, both perspectives. Uh, so a disciplinary, from a disciplinary uh, perspective, I'm, I'm an historian, but my field is, is Jewish uh, uh, studies. Um, and uh, you know, this is a field actually on which I started working already um, when I was about 14 years old, um, when I uh, found myself in an archive and the archivist asked me, um, uh, what, what kind of material do you want to, to look at? And uh, I said, well, do you have anything about the Jewish community, uh, the local community over here? And he said, yes, of course, I, I, I do. Uh, and so I, I got a, 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 like piles of documents from the archives um, and uh, I started reading this uh, since I, I knew uh, already from, from very early on I, I wanted to be an historian. So that, that was the reason why I went to this archive uh, but without having an idea exactly what it is and how, how, how it works. Um, uh, so I, I, was, I was going through this, this material and uh, then someone um entered the room and he started looking uh, over my shoulder and said like hey kids what are you doing um and i said well i'm, I'm looking at documents about the jewish community over here um, and then this person introduced himself and said well, I'm, I'm the president of the local historical association do you want to write an article about this subject for our journal um so that's how it started i immediately wrote three articles um, and, and from that moment on, I, I've been doing research uh, in the archives uh, and uh, I, I found my, my subject and my calling, so, so to say. Um, so um, and, and, um, it, it, the connection with archives is important for me um, uh, as um, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, there uh, are quite some archives with a considerable Jewish collections, with material in Yiddish, in Hebrew in Portuguese and Spanish. Um, and uh, a lot of this is, is not studied by any scholars uh, as of yet. Um, so uh, there's so much material to, 
to uh, to work on um, that I, I feel really privileged to be in this field and to, to work on this subject. And I'm sure we'll get to talk a little bit about those extensive archives, the most you know largest collection of of Jewish you know archives um, in a Dutch community and uh, the Eitz Chaim Library. I'm sure we'll, we'll make mention of this. And, and as you already mentioned, the different languages everything's in and why that is for listeners that aren't sure, we'll discuss that as well. So let me just ask you, though, uh, to, to begin, um, wh- how, why specifically were you interested in Dutch uh, Jewish history? Um, well, the, 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 the history of, of Dutch Jewry is, um, is, is, is interesting from, for several reasons. I, I think it's um, uh, first for, for the early modern period. Uh, in the early modern period, uh, in the 17th century, uh, the, the, the Portuguese community, the, the Sephardic community of Amsterdam was uh, of of um, like great uh, significance uh, and not not just of local significance but as well uh, internationally. Whereas in the 18th century, it's the Ashkenazi community uh, and that grew into the largest uh, community actually in uh, in in Europe at at, at the time. Um, so studying um, uh, Amsterdam Jewry, Dutch Jewry is an angle into Jewish history at large. Whereas at the same time, it's also an angle into Dutch history. Um, and for me, that, that's, that's a very important element. I always try to combine these two um, uh, approaches. So uh, in order to properly analyze the history of Jews in the Netherlands, you need to be steeped into Dutch history, uh, uh, and which is quite a complicated history. Uh, uh, since nowadays it's, it's a kingdom, but it used to be a republic. Um, uh, it was a colonial empire as well. Um, so it, it's, it's quite a complicated uh, um, a subject uh, already, Dutch history. And then there is um, a Jewish history at large, uh, uh, both uh, Sephardic history and Ashkenazi history. And um, actually, uh, Dutch history is the, 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 the culmination of all these elements and, and um, uh, the connecting and the intersecting of um, of these histories, and, and that's precisely where Dutch Jewry uh, is 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 being made. Uh, uh, actually, it's the the, the the crossing of all these uh, developments and all these histories uh, uh, with each other. Okay, so let's actually pick up on that on the general Dutch history. As you mentioned, it was a republic, it was a kingdom, colonial empire. There's a lot of different aspects, and just specifically, like the book is the, Jew, the history of the Jews in the Netherlands. So, what is the Netherlands for listeners that are familiar geographically? Where is it located? Um, I know we're doing this audio on a, on, a, on a podcast; it's not visual, but as much as you know to explain where is this, and then as it you know has changed throughout the centuries, um, you know basically a broad overview of the history of the Netherlands and geographically yeah. and historically. Well, the Netherlands is a dynamic concept. Um, uh, so it, it's, um, um, it, it, the term is already being used in medieval times, but back then the Netherlands is um, a, basically what is nowadays the Netherlands, Belgium, um, uh, Luxembourg and the north of France. And so um, a, a much larger a territory that um, ended up um, um, uh, under one uh, sovereign lord um, uh, in the Habsburg, in the Habsburg uh, uh, Empire. Um, but at that time, there were uh, different languages being spoken. Um, so like the Dutch language and the Frisian language, but also French uh, was being used in, in these territories. Um, and um, uh, um, it, it's, it's only gradually that they um, claim an identity for themselves, distinct from like, the, the German uh, uh, Empire um, and, and different from other Habsburg territories. Um, now, in, uh, the, um, in, in, at the beginning of the early modern period, uh, the, 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 the Dutch got into conflict with their sovereign, uh, being King uh, um, Philip II of Spain, uh, who was the Habsburg emperor, uh, and in, in that sense, uh, the, the, he also was in charge of um, the, um, uh, the Netherlands. Um, and um, there, were, there were two developments. He, he wanted to control, uh, better control his territories, uh, and have more taxes out of these territories. So he was centralizing uh, the, the politics. 
Um, but he also had uh, uh, huge problems with the rise of Protestantism in, in his territories, uh, as he was a devout, devout uh, Catholic. So because of religious reasons and of political reasons, um, uh, the, the, the Netherlands um, uh, rose uh, in a rebellion against him. Um, and in the end, they ended up uh, uh, being split um, in what becomes the Republic the, the, in the north um, and the southern Netherlands, which later on becomes Belgium, um, uh, which um, is uh, um, uh, until the Napoleonic period uh, in the hands of, uh, of the Habsburg uh, um, uh, dynasty. So um, uh, from that moment on, um, our book is mostly dealing with the North, with the Republic, the Dutch Republic, as it's uh, mostly uh, called. Now, this Dutch Republic um, uh, becomes a very successful colonial uh, um, uh, player um, with extensive territories in the East, in uh, nowadays Indonesia, um, but also in, uh, in the West, uh, in the Americas. First in Brazil, later on in um, uh, what's nowadays the United States of America, um, uh, New Amsterdam turning into New, New York, um, but also uh, Curaçao, Suriname, um, uh, and several other um, um, uh, territories in uh, in the Caribbean. Um, now, um, from uh, in in the in, in, in the modern period in 1815, the Netherlands transforms from uh, being a republic into a monarchy. So it, this is quite, quite a, a different trajectory than a lot of other countries. Eh? So the Netherlands started as a republic, but became a monarchy. Um, most scholars would say a monarch, monarch, monarchy in name only, being that um, uh, this, the monarchy can only function um, in, in a pseudo-republican setting. So uh, Republican traditions are, are very strong in the sense of curtailing uh, a, a monarchy. Um, now, um, in the period of decolonization, after the Second World War, the Netherlands lost most of its colonial uh, um, territories um, and, uh, and, and basically got its shape uh, as, as it has it, of, of, of now, which is uh, the European Netherlands with um, six uh, um, isles, islands in, in the Caribbean. Um, mainly being Curaçao, Aruba, um, and several other uh, small uh, islands. And so that, that's what the Netherlands is right now. But it's, it's very dynamic. And in that sense, studying the history of Jews in the Netherlands, and therefore, is also quite dynamic and includes as well colonial history, uh, uh, for instance, in uh, both in, in the Americas and in the Dutch East Indies. Right, for sure. So Curacao, like you said, it still is. Um, there's been a lot of Jewish history there. Suriname, I think, was until recently. A lot of Jewish history there as well. I've been written on that. Um, and then, uh, as you mentioned, where, you know, um, America, what, you know, the United States, what today's United States used to be, and as, as well as Brazil and Recife, we'll talk about maybe Rizkavov da Fonseca being the first I guess, rabbi in the Americas in Recife um, at that time. So, okay, so let's start off. When, when does J Dutch D Jews first come to the Netherlands or, you know, Dutch Jewry, uh, so to speak? Yeah. And, and, and then kind of in the beginning and how they, you know, during the Middle Ages as well. Because as you said, the main part will mainly be focused on the early modern period and the modern period. So just, the, the, but before that, what's the history of the Jews there? In a way, you could say there, there are two beginnings of, of Jewish history in, uh, in in the Low Countries. So the Low Countries being the Netherlands, uh, um, uh, including uh, Belgium. Um, now, um, in, in medieval times, uh, there are Jewish communities, but mostly in the southern Netherlands, in, in what is nowadays Belgium. And that's um, because um, Jews mostly settled uh, in uh, on the trajectories uh, of trade, from uh, Germany to England. Um, and there was a, a, an important um, um, trajectory from trade from Cologne um, uh, to Bruges uh, to, uh, to England. Um, and uh, cities located on, on this uh, um, road, um, like Louvain, uh, Brussels, uh, uh, they got Jewish communities. Um, uh, now, and th there were, there were uh, maybe uh, like there was there's some others in Maastricht, for instance, and uh, in in Gelre, uh, but these were um, um, like not very significant uh, communities. Uh, now, most of these um, 
uh, medieval um, Ashkenazi communities uh, in medieval times, they um, suffered the same um, uh, terrible consequences as uh, as most um, uh, European uh, Jews uh, in the in the late medieval times, uh, and uh, either. There were expulsions. Um, there is um, in Brussels um, a, a famous incident um, that is uh, still um, being, um, in some sort of way, celebrated in, in the, the major church in, in Brussels, the Cathedral of Brussels, uh, which, which still has um, um, a, a whole um, a window and, and, and a chapel devoted to um, a, a story about the local Jews um, who. Um, try to get um, the holy body of Jesus from the church, and then the uh, the, the, the body starts to um, blood, uh, and so they betray themselves, and well, this ends up in um, the Jews being uh, expulsed from uh, from Brussels, uh, and uh, this miracle um, is is being uh, celebrated. Um, it, it, it's some sort of cult in uh, in Brussels. Uh, although nowadays the Catholic Church in in Brussels is uh, very well aware of the problematic aspects of, of this, so they have tuned down. Um, but still, there there is uh, there, there are a lot a lot of reminiscences to to it in uh, in, in Brussels, in, in the, the the capital of Belgium. Um, so, uh, but but. At the end of, of medieval times, uh, basically, there are no Jews left in um, uh, in the low countries in the Netherlands. Um, and so, therefore, uh, most histories of the Jews in the Netherlands start in the early modern period, because there is no connection between medieval history and the early modern uh, history. Yeah, so this is uh, documented in the book, in the first chapter, by, I'm going to probably ruin this, the Dutch name by BMJ speed spite. However, you, you'll correct me on that. And then there's a number of chapters. So then really the early modern period and the Spanish Portuguese community, the Sephardic community, which is interesting because right. The, the, the Netherlands is in an Ashkenazic area um, of, you know, so to speak of Europe, mm-hmm. but it becomes a Sephardic community first, as you mentioned at the beginning. So there's chapters in the book are by uh, Daniel uh, Swachinsky, Swachinsky, if I'm butchering the names, I apologize, Jonathan Israel, and then Yosef Kaplan, who's the preeminent historian on this, ha- has uh, a chapter on this as well. So let's talk a little bit about how the Spanish-Portuguese community comes into being there, these former conversos, Moranos, um, and then the Netherlands suddenly becomes this Amsterdam, especially becomes this hub, this main location of the Sephardic diaspora, the Sephardic uh, communities? Well, of course, the, the fascinating uh, um, uh, aspect is that the beginning of, um, uh, the, the second beginning of Jewish life in the Netherlands, it, it doesn't start with Jews, but it starts with Catholics um, mm-hmm. coming from Portugal. Um, and at least initially um, in Amsterdam, also settling as Catholics. Um, and it, it, it takes some time before they they, they start an internal debate within this colony they they, they found in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam um, which is basically an economic colony. Yeah, these are businessmen uh, from Portugal, um, and uh, Portugal is very successful in on the colonial markets, um, and quite some uh, 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 people are are active in this, and they want to control uh, the sale of colonial goods throughout Europe. So the idea is that uh, family members um, are settling in the major economic hubs of, of Europe um, in order to control um, the, uh, the, the, the the flow of, um, of economic and colonial goods. Um, now, it, it, that's also how in Amsterdam um, a Portuguese uh, um, economic colony is, is founded, um, of like the Catholic people, but they, they find out that they settle in a, in a city, the city of Amsterdam, that has just um, changed its religious identity from Catholicism to Protestantism. But these people um, um, had to, to ask themselves, what are we going to do? Are we remaining Catholics, which means secondary citizens in, in Amsterdam, um, or are we going to convert to Protestantism? Well, some in this community argued, let's become Protestant. Um, um, others argued, well, Catholicism is all we know. Let's simply remain Catholic. But finally, the majority of this community is making an extraordinary choice. Um, uh, they, 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 make, they choose to become Jewish. Um, 
Now, in medieval times, it was always possible for a Jew to become a Christian, but it was never possible for a Christian to become Jewish. Um, now, in Amsterdam, there is a situation of religious mobility that enables people to change their religious identities. Um, and that's actually what a lot of not only like these Portuguese immigrants are doing, but a lot of Amsterdam people, they, they don't know exactly what they are. They, they have to, to, to make a choice uh, if they are Catholic or Lutherans or Calvinists or Mennonites, or they, they, they are changing their religious identities quite often um, um, because they're, they're looking for, for their identity. And within this um, uh, religious mo mobility, um, uh, it becomes possible as well for these people from Portugal to argue, well, if we are going to change our religious identity, why shouldn't we opt for Judaism? Since that's the identity of our families from 100 years before. So their families have been um, Catholics for 100 years, um, and now they, um, they, 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 they choose for, for Judaism. And to be honest, for most of them, they, this is a choice for a religion that they actually don't know. So mo most of the things they know about Judaism is through Catholic uh, polemic books against Judaism. That, that's mostly what, what I knew about Judaism. Um, and that's why and there's this, this term of Yosef Kaplan, who calls these people the new Jews from new Christians, nuevos cristianos, conversos, they transform into new Jews, Yehudim um, Chadashim. Uh, um, and uh, that means not only that they are becoming Jewish, but as well that they invent some sort of new type of Judaism uh, over here, uh, um, which is qualified by Om Judesmo, uh, the good, the civilized Judaism, um, uh, which is contrasted with Judaism elsewhere in the world, mostly Ashkenazi Judaism, of course. Um, and they, they believe that um, they cre create a Judaism in Amsterdam, um, which is fully halachic uh, uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, is also compatible with the lifestyle of these people. And, and these are international businessmen. They love opera. They love classical uh, music. They love poetry, secular poetry. Um, uh, and they believe that they can combine all this in uh, Daniel Swetsinski is calling this a, a patchwork identity. And so they have an identity which is composed of Iberian elements, um, even though they've left the Iberian Peninsula, they're still very proud of their Portuguese and Spanish heritage. Um, they have become Jewish uh, and they integrate their Jewish identity into the patchwork as well. And they've settled in the Netherlands uh, and they also start adopting to Dutch culture. And, and basically what I create is a, a, a new type of Jewish identity in which Iberian, Dutch and Jewish elements are fused together, um, and which is um, quite um, of a high standard. Um, it's it's uh, adopted to um, a high culture, um, uh, the high culture that these people uh, used to, to live in, uh, both uh, in, in Portugal and in the Dutch Republic. Right. Now, there are... They start establishing um, communities. There are shuls. They eventually merge. So we can talk about that. And it's Chaim, the, the yeshiva, the school system, and all that is entailed. Um, the, the, obviously, there's many famous rabbanim, uh, rabbis at this time. Menashe ben Israel, uh, like I mentioned, Shol Mortera. Um, there are others that I'm forgetting offhand of here. I'm sure you'll mention other ones. And there are also famous heretics. The real Dacasta, Baruch Spinoza, Benedict Spinoza. And that has to do with, like you said, they didn't know they... When they a lot of them came back, they didn't know the, um, they only knew of let's say biblical Judaism. They were only familiar with the Bible part of it. There's other you know scholarly works been done on this. Um, mm. So you can talk about this and how the community was like I said established different shuls and different communities kind of thing and how it merges um, together to become one community. As well as one more thing you should mention the the mamad as well the structure of the community how the community functioned there. Um, yeah, so in, in, indeed, this, this is a, a quite, in that sense, a quite an extraordinary community as it's rapidly growing. Um, it, it, of course, the, the municipal um, authorities in Amsterdam, they, they were a bit surprised because they had accepted Catholics into uh, their, uh, their city. And suddenly these Catholics transform into Jews. So um, it, it takes some time before 
the city comes to, comes, comes to terms with this. Um, but in the end, they decide to, to grant the, uh, the community the status of a what's called a Jewish nation, which means that they are um, um, welcome uh, in, to, to settle in Amsterdam um, uh, as long as they, they pay their taxes uh, and um, they um, uh, don't interfere with the economic life of the existing population of, of, of Amsterdam. Um, and, and then it, it, it's, it's, it's fine. So uh, the community rapidly is, is rapidly growing um, and also becomes uh, some sort of uh, primus inter pares, uh, the, the mo a mother community, um, uh, the first community in the Western Sephardic uh, uh, diaspora. Uh, precisely because, uh, as, as you already said, uh, there's Eitz Chaim, which becomes the training institution for Melamedim, for teachers, for Chazanim, for um, rabbis, for basically the whole Sephardic, Western Sephardic diaspora. Uh, so um, if someone in Bordeaux or in Hamburg or in London or in New Amsterdam or in Suriname, if, you, if, if a Jewish community needed new rabbi or a new chazan, you simply wrote a letter to Amsterdam saying like, could you send us someone? Do you have someone? Um, uh, or, or they send their local people to Amsterdam to study. Um, uh, if there were problems within communities elsewhere and they couldn't settle it, they went to the Amsterdam team to, to ask the, the Amsterdam rabbis to settle their, uh, their conflicts. And so the Sephardic community in Amsterdam um, uh, therefore becomes the, um, um, yeah, the, the, the most, um, the leading community uh, uh, during the early modern period um, um, for, for a very long, uh, long time. Um, and um, it, it, they, they try to, um, to, to develop their own profile. Uh, and this, this is this profile of um, um, adherence to um, halachic Judaism, but at the same time, um, it has to be modern or early modern uh, as well. Um, and so, uh, for instance, they, they themselves were trained at the best schools of, of Europe, Jesuit schools in, uh, in Portugal and in Spain, and, and they adopt the uh, pedagogical model uh, of these uh, schools to Eitz Chaim. So Eitz Chaim is, in that sense, becomes a very modern um, a Jewish uh, school, and uh, the, 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 it, it's well known that great rabbis, uh, when they visit Amsterdam, uh, uh, for instance, the, the author of Shneilu uh, Hurwitz, when, when he comes to Amsterdam and he sees the uh, the Chaim system uh, and, and how the Portuguese are, are training the kids, uh, uh, he says, like, we should do it uh, all over Ashkenaz in exactly the same way. This is really a model for all of us. Um, uh, yeah, so he wants to, he advocates turning from the Haider model to the Eitz uh, uh, model. Um, and it, it, you could say it's only later on that the, the Haskalah is, is really taking up this, uh, this threat. Um, but it, it's already very early uh, that the, the, the Portuguese community is, uh, is, is trying to develop this, uh, this new uh, model. Um, and uh, indeed, as, as you say, uh, the, it was quite hard for rabbis to, to be in charge of this community um, because a, a lot of people came in, uh, they became Jewish, um, um, or even they didn't become yet Jewish. There was it, it, at least initially quite a large group of people who were participating in the community, but they, they didn't let themselves to be circumcised uh, because they that, that, that's like the final step they didn't want to take. And um, um, actually quite quite some people were hesitant. They, they didn't know exactly if they were Catholics or, the, or if they were Jews. Um, there's, there's a great story about the, um, the grandfather of Spinoza, uh, the philosopher. Um, when the grandfather died, um, his, his kids uh, wanted to have him to, to be buried at the Portuguese Jewish cemetery. So they went to the rabbinate and they said, like, OK, we want our, our grandfather to be to be buried uh, uh, over there. But then the rabbinate said, well, um, your grandfather isn't Jewish. Um, he didn't register with the community. He didn't like uh, uh, come out. Um, um, he's, he's a Catholic. So go to the Catholic church to have him buried over there. Um, now the family, of course, didn't want to accept it. Um, and finally, they reached a compromise, and the compromise was that uh, the, the grandfather of Spinoza 
was um, what is Brit Mila post mortem. So, um, and, and that's, that's the only way to be buried uh, at, uh, at Beit Chaim, at the, uh, the cemetery of the Portuguese community. And so he is, um, uh, in, in, in this, this points us to an intriguing element of how this community gradually is becoming Jewish. Um, it's not like from one day to the other day, um, that, that's, it's, it becomes a Froom community. No, uh, um, it, it takes very long. Um, and there, there are quite some um, people in the community who like, are not fond of halakha and of the regulations, and, uh, and they try to um, to uh, adhere to their own interpretation of, of Judaism. Yeah, so uh, th- then there's also, like I alluded, mentioned earlier, you have this um, these kind of shuls, so to speak, with just even though that's not like what they were, but they and then they become the Kal Kadosh Talmud Torah, but it was Beis Yaakov, Nevei Shalom, Beis Yisrael, Beis Israel, as they call it, and they merge together, there's a, there are a number of rabbis go together, so what is that process, and what does that become, and again, what does the Mamad exactly mean, yeah. for those that aren't familiar with what that, the, this board, yeah. was, and what their functions, who was on it, and what their functions were. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's a it's it's interesting that in contrast to several other um, Sephardic communities, uh, for instance in Saloniki or in Constantinople um, uh, or Venice, uh, the, the, the the Portuguese community, the Sephardic community in Amsterdam, uh, eventually is merging into one large kila. Um, uh, it, it starts with several distinct uh, um, uh, uh, kilot, um, uh, but it merges into one large uh, kila. Um, and um, well, probably this has to do with um, the municipal authorities who want to have parity, just like one address for the Jewish community, and, and, and it, it, otherwise it becomes all too complex. Um, um, uh, but of course, this also leads to a, a better organization of the community as uh, as a whole. Um, and this community is is chaired uh, by the Mahamat, uh, and the Mahamat are the, the lay leaders of the community. Um, and of course, next to it, there's the Beitin, there, there's the the, um, the, Beitin, the chief rabbi, the Chacham, uh, with the other uh, rabbis. Um, and um, well, to be honest, there is always competition between these two bodies. Um, um, and since the, the Mahamats, they, they basically see themselves as the ones who um, are funding the rabbinate. Uh, they give the salaries to the rabbis. So they, they perceive the rabbis as their um, well, um, uh, employees who simply have to adhere to their orders. Um, whereas, of course, the rabbis, they, um, they don't buy into this argument. They say, well, we have our own um, domain, uh, uh, which is halakha, and, and we simply um, um, uh, can't uh, take your orders. Um, so th- th- there are quite some conflicts as well between the Muhammad and, uh, and the rabbinate. Um, and it, it takes some time for that is that there's some sort of balance uh, uh, between uh, uh, the two. Now you, you could argue that the the Mahmat is um, basically the Jewish government of uh, of, of the, the community, uh, since um, uh, it, the, the municipal authorities they um, they've argued uh, Jews are welcome to settle in Amsterdam, but they have to arrange everything for themselves. Meaning education, um, uh, poor relief, um, uh, taking care for the sick, uh, having their own cemeteries, uh, uh, everything uh, by their own. Um, uh, and that means that the Mahamad was very powerful. Um, and they, they could really control, in that sense, uh, the, the lives of individual uh, Jews in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, for instance, if they argued that someone um, should be banished from Amsterdam. Um, they simply had. Uh, they simply could go to the local police and say, "We don't, we don't like this person anymore in Amsterdam. Please bring him to the borders of the city and um, uh, let him go." Um, and the police simply did it. Um, and so, the, in that sense, there was also uh, quite a good cooperation with the municipal authorities and with the local police in policing the community. Right, and they would put Kherim. I mean, there's even stories of them putting Kherim yeah. in Rabbanim, right? Menashe ben Israel, back and forth, there's fights. So, yeah. 
So there's that. So obviously there's a lot more, and I would hope to do more podcast episodes about this community, um, but we want to get the book covers the broad scope of ne- the, the Dutch Jewish history we want to get there. I, w- I will mention, though, there's obviously Menashe Ben Israel, who I did an episode in the past with uh, Professor Stephen Nadler about, and he has he has a, print- he has a printing press. Um, there are a number of other famous rabbis, just to throw out uh, Shlomo Ayalon, who I who was mentioned a number of times in the series I did on Shabbat Tzvi, of course. Shabbat Tzvi, indeed. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ramesh Rafal, the, the Aguilar, Shlomo de Oliveira, uh, Yehuda Leon T- Templo, then, and, and many mm-hmm. other famous rabbis and authors of, 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 of many works. Um, so then we get to the Ashkenazi community, which, as you had said, one after the Middle Ages kind of disappears. So now there is a new kind of Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi community that starts. So talk about how that starts and how that, and eventually, as you said, is going to become it's, you know, a century or two later, the dominant community in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, you, you could argue that the 17th century is the century of the Sephardic community, um, and in its shadow, um, the, the, a, a tiny Ashkenazi community is uh, is gradually gradually uh, um, uh, growing uh, already in the 17th century, but in the 18th century, the Ashkenazi community becomes the dominant uh, community, not not just locally, uh, so they. Uh, um, already in the beginning of, of the 18th century, they are larger than the Sephardic uh, community, but eventually they become the largest community in uh, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a truly remarkable story. And um, what we also um, encountered when we composed this book, um, whereas we know a lot about the 17th century um, Amsterdam Sephardim, uh, the Portuguese community, um, it, we know much less about the 18th century Ashkenazi community. And that's really surprising because um, and this is the community of Chacham Svi, and this is the community of Shaul Amsterdam. Uh, um, so, uh, great, important rabbis were um, uh, at, at the head of this, uh, this community. Um, and this is the location where um, the vast majority of Hebrew and Yiddish books was being published. Um, uh, across uh, and, and they were uh, like, transported to like Jewish communities across Europe, but as well to the New World, to um, uh, present-day India, um, uh, to uh, Africa. Um, um, so, um, in, in, in that sense, it's um, it, it, that's really a field where, um, well, we saw in this book we could um, uh, already give a lot more analysis into the, the, the 18th century Ashkenazi community than books before, textbooks on, on the Jewish history from, say, 20 years uh, 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 before this one. Um, but still, th- there's a lot to be done uh, uh, here, absolutely. Um, now, it, it, the fascinating aspect is that in the 18th century, the economy of Amsterdam is uh, gradually um, um, becoming worse um, uh, and uh, the city um, is not attracting so much uh, um, migrants anymore except for Jews, um, Ashkenazi Jews um, from the German uh, lands, from Central Europe, from uh, Lithuania, uh, the Russian Empire, um, uh, a steady um, uh, yeah, transfer of, of people to, to Amsterdam. To, and, and most of these people are very, very poor. Uh, and that gives the Ashkenazi community, of course, a, a distinct identity next to the, the much more successful um, Sephardic community with a lot of international tradesmen. Um, uh, here we have a community of, of mostly poor people um, uh, working in um, um, uh, like um, tiny uh, businesses, uh, trading um, across Europe. Um, and that's mostly what, what they do in order to survive. Um, um, yet uh, this, this, uh, this is a, a community that is um, um, uh, having its own shuls, um, uh, a lot of rabbis, um, and um, is um, in that sense um, successful in establishing itself um, and within the, the larger Ashkenazi world as, as a rabbinic center uh, of its own. Right. And obviously there's, there's just to point out a lot of what we're discussing here, we're trying to give a very general overview. The book does a lot more in depth. I mean, I'm skimming, we're jumping chapters. We're not going to cover the whole thing. So the listeners interested in more, definitely check out the book, which will be a link in the show's notes too. So um, uh, before we jump ahead, I mean, I, I should mention that chapter six in the book you wrote as well as the last chapter and chapter six is on the 19th century. So we'll, we'll jump a little unless you have something else to say on the 18th century. But the, the other but either the eight, mentioned the 18th century, the other thing that which we kind of did mention already um, 
uh, the other thing that I would mention um, is that we, we mentioned Amsterdam a number of times, um, but were there any other cities in the Netherlands that had Jewish communities? Of course, we, we made mention to Curaçao and Suriname and the colonies where there were, and, and I made mention, we didn't talk about it, there was, a, there was in Brazil for a while, I just mentioned that Recife there, uh, when the Dutch were in charge, the Yusikavu of da Fonseca, and I think our Moshe Fold, the Aguilar went and they were the rabbis, but when the Spanish uh, reconquered it, they had to come back, so they went back to Amsterdam. Um, so that was there for a little bit, but um, but anyways, on the were there other cities that had a Jewish community in the Netherlands? Um, so the Dutch Republic um, uh, had um, decided uh, that the policy to have Jews um, in, um, in in a city or in um, um, a, a local territory um, was decentralized. So there was no national policy um, in the Dutch Republic on. Um, on Jews. Um, and this meant that there were cities in the Dutch Republic that were not welcoming to Jews, uh, where Jews were not allowed to settle. Um, uh, there were cities, um, especially in the east of, um, of the country, close, close by to the Germanic countries, um, uh, that accepted only a fixed number of Jews. Um, so there you have tiny Jewish uh, communities. Um, whereas um, uh, uh, a lot of big cities, uh, especially in the west of, uh, of the country, uh, like The Hague, uh, Rotterdam, um, uh, Leiden, uh, Haarlem, um, but also um, in Frisia, Leeuwarden, Groningen, Zwolle, um, uh, all these cities also got their own Jewish communities, and especially the communities of Rotterdam, and of the Hague were important communities uh, um, with having uh, important rabbis uh, uh, by themselves um, um, and considerable communities, although, of course, they, they never reached the level of, of Amsterdam. And so there's always the, the story in the history of, of, of Dutch Jews. It's always Amsterdam and the rest. Um, but the rest uh, uh, being uh, the, the remnant, uh, the remaining part uh, is, is, is quite diverse in the sense that there are several big cities uh, with large Jewish communities, with several thousands of Jews living uh, uh, there in the early modern period. Um, and even uh, tiny villages, especially in the 19th century, where um, many, many villages um, had their own Jewish communities, uh, including their shuls and uh, cemeteries and, and kosher bakeries and kosher uh, um, um, butchers. Um, so um, it, it, across the Netherlands in the early modern period, um, uh, there was um, it, it was um, uh, it, juridically from a juridical perspective seen um, uh, quite complicated for a Jew to travel uh, because there were cities where you, you knew you could stay overnight. And there were cities where you couldn't. Um, and so um, you, you had to know, it, it's very layered. You had to know what specific conditions there were for Jews um, uh, in a specific uh, uh, territory. And so um, there's this whole debate on uh, like Dutch tolerance uh, in the early modern period. And um, well, this is mostly uh, the story of Amsterdam and, and cities in, in the Western part of the country. But there's also a, a story of um, um, a much darker story, uh, so to say, uh, um, and that, that's mostly not included. And therefore, it's, it's really important to, um, to to give a more balanced uh, approach in, in that sense. And, and so, yeah, next to um, um, accepting uh, cities, there were also cities that uh, didn't want to, to have Jews, at least until 1796. Since 1796 is the year of the emancipation of Dutch Jews, uh, um, uh, as the second country in the world after France, uh, Jews were given equal rights. Uh, and from that moment on, Jews could settle everywhere in the country. Now, for the colonies, um, um, in the colonies in the West, um, so in the Americas, um, uh, the, 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 these were in attractive to Jews. Um, and so initially in Brazil, there was uh, um, a Jewish community, but when Brazil was lost to the Netherlands, uh, a part of these people resettled to New Amsterdam um, and to Suriname. Um, so Suriname becomes a, a major hub as well. Um, also a location, to be honest, when, when too much poor Jews um, enter 
in, in Amsterdam, uh, the Portuguese community uh, thinks that this is bad for their publicity in society. Um, so they uh, they hire a, a, a ship and they simply send all these people to Suriname, um, knowing that these people couldn't afford to, to come back to uh, to the Netherlands. Um, so uh, if like part of the the, the history of um, of the Jewish communities in um, in in Suriname um, is is like quite complicated in in that sense. Um, so and Curaçao as well had a huge Jewish community, um, uh, which uh, was in close contact as well with the Amsterdam uh, community. So uh, across like the Dutch Republic um, and the the colonial uh, empire, there were uh, um, communities, absolutely. Right. I think something you mentioned, The Hague. I think uh, Menach Gnozim of Shalom's Journal just published something, someone's there from The Hague. And then uh, just in general, if anyone's interested in, in, in like, Sfarim, um, there's the Mechon Yishalayim, there's three volumes, this Kisvei, Rabbi Yitzchak, Avo, Avda, Fonseca. There's a number, it's not only his stuff, even though that's what it's called, V'chach me receive you, but there's a lot of different mm-hmm. rabbis' uh, writings in there. Um, you mentioned Rav Shal of, of Amsterdam, Binin Ariel. People can find a yeah. new edition of that, and obviously Chacham Tzvi. And there's there's a number of other, obviously Menachem in Israel, and Give Us Shal of Shal Mortera hasn't been redone, I don't think. There's there's a number of, of works. I'm just throwing out some some yeah. people are interested in right. checking out. I'm sure that there's there's many more. So then you, you mentioned uh, 1796 and Napoleon and his brother being in charge. Uh, you didn't mention his brother, but there's his brother that gets put mm. in charge. And then, uh, like I said, you mentioned you wrote Chapter Six, which you titled Religious. Relig- Relig- Jacity, civility, and industry, the centralization, nationalization of the Dutch Jews, 1814 to 1870. So the real 19th century. Um, so talk a little bit about that chapter and what you discuss and, and about the 19th century. Yeah. Now, um, in, in the 19th century, um, um, well, across Europe, um, especially in Western Europe, we see that, um, uh, like you could say, like in the early modern period, there, there's still this this concept of Ashkenaz, of, of Jews traveling across Europe and everywhere. You could speak Yiddish, and um, uh, it, in some sort of way, this was a continuum um, where people traveled and, and well, how they perceived their identities. Ashkenaz was an imagined. Uh, um, a space where, where people moved in, in in the early modern period. Now, in the 19th century, we have a process in which um, um, Jewish communities start to identify with the nation state. Um, and in some sort of way, this is breaking up part of the traditional um, uh, networks uh, um, um, of solidarity uh, across Ashkenaz and across uh, Svarat. Um, so here in, in the Netherlands, uh, there's a, a process of creating um, a, a Dutch Jewish identity. Um, it's not s- simply a Jewish identity. No, it's it's a Dutch Jewish identity. Or even to be more precise, um, it's a Dutch Israelite identity. They start calling themselves Dutch Israelites, and um, I think the terminology is it, it says a lot uh, by by labeling themselves Israelites. Um, and they they argued what well, Israel over here in the 19th century is not so much a term that has national connotation. Israel is, is used because it's um, it's the, um, the self-identification of Jews in the Hebrew Bible, um, and therefore it is perceived as a, a religious term. So Israelite um, means belonging to Jewish religion. Um, now, this is not just a religion. It's the Israelite religion. Meaning, it's a religion of the Hebrew Bible. Now, in European societies, um, which were at the time dominantly Christian, there was a, a lot of reference, uh, especially in, in the Netherlands, for the, the Bible. Um, and by saying, by arguing, we are Israelites, they argued, well, um, society, you appreciate the Hebrew Bible? Uh, well, guess what? The people from the Hebrew Bible are still alive. That's us. So there's a, a, a connection between the Bible and the Jews. Um, so the Jews, in some sort of way, establish themselves through a category of culture. Like um, this is Jewish identity. Jewish culture is on, on the same level, they argued, as um, Latin and Greek. Uh, the ancient Romans, the ancient Greek, and the ancient Jews, they, they, they all together, they delivered the sources for Western civilization. Um, so 
Um, Jews, um, at, at the beginning of the century, uh, uh, the majority of Jews, the majority were Ashkenazi and were very poor. Uh, people looked down upon them. Um, uh, by, by reinventing themselves as Israelites, uh, they argued, well, um, actually, we might be poor, but we are bearers of a great culture, uh, of a great cultural tradition, the, the tradition of Israel. Um, we are Israelites. Now, this Israelite identity, Israelite culture, is connected to Dutch identity. Um, and um, in the 19th century, Dutch identity is um, uh, perceived as an identity of moderation. Dutch people don't like extremes. The French like extremes. They go on strike. They do. They have revolutions. The Germans like to have extremes. Uh, they fight all the time. Uh, um, um, but Dutch people, they like moderation. Um, and um, 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 so, and, and they are the, 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 the people of toleration. Um, and so they believe that they are a tolerant nation. Now, Dutch Jews, they argued that they were bringing together, and that's the idea of the 19th century, the best of Dutch tradition, of Dutch culture, and the best of Israelite culture. And they fused it together, which meant they were, as Israelites, they were Dutch. They were Dutch. It's a hyphenate, hyphenated identity. So what does it mean to be a Dutch Jew? It means a moderate Jew, a Jew who um, 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 is, um, is, is really shocked by what he is seeing in Germany, in Germany where Jewish communities are splitting at the time between uh, in, into reform and orthodox communities. So uh, the, the unity of, of the Jewish community is completely broken in Germany because of uh, reform ex extreme extremism. Uh, the Dutch Jews argued. Well, they, they argued, if you look at Eastern Europe, there you have like the Midnachim and the Hasidim and the Maskelim, and, and it's even worse over there. And there, uh, there is the, uh, the rise of, of uh, cultural orthodoxy, which is another type of uh, extremism. Now, the Dutch Jewish identity is an identity of moderation. So um, uh, the, the Dutch Jews decided to not to, to, to mingle with reform Judaism on the one hand, uh, nor with East European uh, um, um, uh, orthodoxy on the other hand. So they, 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 they tried to carve um, a new Jewish identity, which was orthodox, but moderate. Um, in a way, you could argue that this is some sort of continuation of the Portuguese model. What the Portuguese were trying to do, eh? being civilized on the one hand and being um, halakhically orthodox on the other hand. But that's basically what becomes um, the foundation of Dutch Jewish identity. And you have to say that this was quite successful um, as Reform Judaism um, um, didn't uh, get into the Dutch. Uh, uh, Jewish community uh, um, until the 1930s when German Jewish immigrants brought Reform Judaism uh, in, in the country. Um, and so um, it, it's, it's part of historic Dutch Jewish identity to be a member of the Orthodox uh, community. Now, um, and, and this is called a unitary uh, community, um, uh, which, which means that all Jews are, 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 mem are members of, of this community. Um, um, it means as well that the rabbi is orthodox, um, uh, the bais din is orthodox. The um, uh, what happens within shul is absolutely according to halacha, but um, the, the individual identities of the members is their individual um, responsibility. So, um, the rabbi, of course, will say. I, I would love that, uh, that everyone is Shomei and Mitzvot, uh, and I, I encourage you to, to, uh, to live uh, an, an Orthodox life. Um, but in the end, it's, it's up to the individual um, to decide whether or not to uh, live kosher. Uh, um, and th that's an individual decision. Within the community, um, everyone is treated equal. So if you are living from, or if you're living absolutely um, secular, um, in shul, um, you're all the same. And everyone can get an aliyah, la Torah, and everyone can 
participate. Everyone can become a board member um, of, of the community, even if you're secular, um, as long as you adhere to the formal identity, which means that the rabbi is orthodox. Um, uh, we follow uh, in, in, in like everything we do according to, to the orthodox halakha. Um, it, this basically is, is the model of Dutch Jewry up until the Second World War. And uh, it was really a source of pride for Dutch Jews. Um, when they looked at, at Jewish communities elsewhere in the world that were split up, um, they felt a bit sorry, uh, actually. Um, uh, and, and they were really proud that they succeeded in, uh, in, in keeping everyone uh, together in, uh, in, in uh, the Dutch Jewish communities. Um, now, of course, in the early modern periods, there were um, all kinds of individual, like every Jewish community was independent. Um, um, and they're like uh, having a local identity with their own rabbis. Um, in the 19th century, there, there, be, there, there becomes uh, um, a, a process of, of centralization, which means that um, uh, there's the appointment of, of, of an official chief rabbi uh, who um, has to monitor um, uh, Jewish communities in, in a specific um, uh, province of the Netherlands. Um, and the chief rabbis together, they consult each other in setting out the halachic policies. And so there's a, there's a process of centralization uh, uh, taking place, um, uh, which um, is, is part, I think, of the relative success of um, adhering to this moderate orthodox identity and keeping everyone inside uh, the, the community. Um, so, so that's really what, what's happening in the 19th century. Um, next, of course, to a process of in integrating into society. At the beginning of the 19th century, the majority of the community was still speaking Yiddish. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, everyone was speaking Dutch. Um, and so in the, the, the language changed in like two generations from Yiddish to, uh, to, to Dutch. Um, and the, the very specific type of Yiddish that, that used to be spoken in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, Western uh, uh, Yiddish um, uh, is extinct. Uh, and of course, there, there are still words that remain. Uh, there are like little sentences, uh, sayings uh, that are still in Western Yiddish. But no one is speaking integrally anymore his, his language. Um, uh, and so the, the community has also become nationalized uh, in the sense it has uh, started to, to become very Dutch. And um, at least up until the Second World War, also being very proud of this Dutch uh, identity. Okay, right. So I think some of the community you mentioned were the, I can't pronounce it, the PIC and the, the NIC, right? Yes. The, <laughs> yeah, so the pick is the Sephardic community and the Nick is the Ashkenazi community. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Right, it's N-I-K and P-I-K. And there's long, you can pronounce it. I'm not going to uh, yeah. pronounce it. So those are the communities. Right, so now um, about the 19th century, there's one other thing that we should discuss. Obviously, there's much more in your uh, chapter here, but mm -hmm. which is the Pekidim Vemar Kalim, an organization uh, that's established. And, uh, you know, what was the organization and who's yeah. in charge and what did they do? Yeah, that, that's really a fascinating uh, story. Um, so um, uh, in, in the early modern period, uh, there were um, Shadarim coming from the, the, the holy cities um, uh, to uh, Jewish communities in, uh, across Europe to collect money. Um, um, but um, it, like m most of these Shadarim were um, Sephardim. And in the Jewish communities in uh, the Netherlands, especially in The Hague and in Amsterdam, um, Ashkenazim started to question whether um, the Ashkenazi communities in Jerusalem, in Hebron, in Tiveria, uh, in uh, Tzfat were really getting um, the money they, they needed, uh, or that most of the money was going to the Sephardic communities. Um, now, um, they, they took an initiative to found new organization, the Pekedim Ve'amar Kalim, um, headed by the Leran uh, family, uh, a, a banker family, very, very from uh, a family uh, with connections across uh, uh, Europe. And they, they decided to collect the money for the Holy Land themselves. 
So no longer, so they didn't want to accept the, uh, the Shadarim anymore, uh, like the, the emissaries from, um, uh, from the Holy Land, um, because they said, we are going to collect money ourselves, not just in the Netherlands, but across Ashkenaz. Um, um, so they set up a network um, uh, in, uh, in, in Germany, in Central Europe, uh, in the Russian Empire, in France, um, in, in local Jewish communities. So each local Jewish community um, um, had a, a contact person uh, who collected locally the money for um, Holy Land and sent it to Amsterdam, to the, the Pekedim and Amarkalim. Um, and the Pekedim and Amarkalim, um, so they amassed a lot of money for the Holy Land. Um, and they were the ones deciding what to do with the money. So the, um, the, 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 the heads of the communities in Jerusalem, in Hebron, in the other holy cities, they had to send letters to the Pekedim and ask, like, we need a new yeshiva, we need a new school, we need a new shul. Please, uh, are you willing to, to, to uh, um, pay for this? Uh, uh, and in the end, uh, it, it was the Amsterdam Pekedim that took the decisions. Um, in a way, you could say, like, this is the first modern uh, Jewish fundraising uh, uh, organization. And they, uh, they, they, they mobilized and they modernized uh, uh, fundraising uh, across the Jewish world. Um, and, and they were pretty, pretty unchallenged uh, um, in, in doing this uh, until the rise of the Zionist movement. And, of course, the Zionists set up their own fundraising for the Holy Land, and that really becomes a challenge to... Uh, to this uh, Chalukah uh, um, uh, for the old Yishuv in, uh, in uh, the Holy Land. Right, I think actually there was a number of their, maybe their meeting notes were published, right, by Yadis yeah. a while ago, so some of that's been published. It's not around anymore, but used, but that's that was published. Uh, so then really the book, you know, goes until World War II. I'm, I'm trying to flip through the book. I can't find the table. I mean, the amount of Jews that there was um, before World War II, and then there was German... Um, refugees yeah. and then the amount after i mean it went from i'm gonna you'll correct there's like 150,000 to like 14,000 i mean it was a massive yeah. crop it was a massive community and yeah. then they were unfortunately mostly killed so i mean if you want to speak a little bit about the community until world war ii and then yeah. you also wrote the chapter i should mention on post world war ii so until, until today yeah 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 so uh, of course the, the the second world war is a, is a huge uh um uh, uh, in in the history of, of Dutch Jews. uh before um the uh, the war um the, the community um was still largely uh, a part of the of the orthodox uh, denomination of the nik uh, um, uh, even though uh, like vast numbers of Jews uh, were not living an, an orthodox life so uh, especially socialism was quite successful in uh, attracting uh, Jews in, in the cities, in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, in The Hague, um, whereas on the countryside, Jews were more siding with the liberal uh, uh, political uh, uh, party and, and, and movement. Um, and so they, they were, in, in terms of politics, um, uh, the, the profiles were uh, quite uh, uh, distinct. Um, and there was a lot of internal debate. Uh, now, in the 1930s, um, a, a new group of, uh, um, uh, of immigrants uh, entered into Dutch Jewry, um, the German Jews. Um, and uh, these German Jews, uh, a part of them, uh, they, they used the Netherlands as a, as a transit lo location uh, in order to travel to the United States or to, um, to um, Argentina or other locations. Uh, but part of them, some 20,000, uh, state in the Netherlands, um, and uh, they they started building up their own community life, uh, and, and a, a huge part of them uh, consisted of Reformed Jews. Uh, so uh, they didn't feel at home in, in the Orthodox Jewish community, uh, Dutch Jewish community. So they set up uh, a Reform community, and that's really the start of the Reform community. Now. Um, um, from the late 19th century, um, uh, there was also uh, another community that um, had settled in, uh, in the Netherlands, mostly in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, and in The Hague, um, uh, which, which were East European Jews, um, uh, both Mitnapim and Hasidim, Galicianer um, um, and, and Bitvax, uh, and um, they also didn't feel at home in like regular uh, Dutch Jewish schools. They found it much too Dutch in a way to 
Protestantized. Uh, um, uh, so um, uh, they, they, they also started their own uh, uh, shuls, although they accepted um, the authority of the Beidin, uh, uh, of, of the, the, the rabbis in, uh, of, of the, the official community. Uh, and that was really important. So they were eating from uh, the shkita, uh, from, from the community. Uh, they didn't set up around uh, um, structures uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but they had their own um, uh, shuls as well, uh, um, uh, according to East European uh, 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 nusach. Um, uh, now, so in that sense, on the eve of uh, the Second World War, um, the community had, had become quite diverse. Um, and still very proud of its identity, but very diverse in religious and in political terms. Um, now, um, it, it, part of like the, the tragedy of Second World War of the Shoah is as well that they felt so at home here. Uh, and they didn't have a history of uh, of, of persecution, um, uh, which compares to Central Europe, for instance. Um, and um, it, it's it's one of the elements. Uh, there's there's a lot of debate it's, it's in, in scholarship. It's called the Dutch paradox. Um, uh, how can we explain that a country that was relatively tolerant to Jews, where Jews really felt at home, uh, that uh, they have this country has the largest number of uh, Jewish victims in, in Western Europe. Um, and so how, how can we explain this? And, and one of the elements, and there are a lot of different uh, elements, but one of the elements is that uh, Dutch Jews really felt at home here and they, they didn't um, think that this could happen. So for a very long time, they, they cleaved to their Dutch identity, uh, whereas the the, the Nazi regime was reducing their identities to a Jewish identity, uh, um, uh, and um, with with like terrible consequences. Um, now, after the war, um, and there is a, a tiny community of some thirty thousand uh, people uh, uh, left. Um, again, most of these people in Amsterdam um, uh, still. Um, uh, there are communities um, even uh, on nowadays in like the larger cities across the Netherlands, um, whereas like Jewish communities in the villages completely disappeared. Before the war, it was quite common for a lot of Dutch people to eat kosher, both Jews and non-Jews, because a lot of butchers across the Netherlands were Jewish butchers, uh, and for like in a small village, the Jewish community was never like large enough. To have like a butcher only catering for the Jewish community. No, of course they also had to, to, to cater the non-Jewish uh, community. So uh, a lot of non-Jews were were selling or were buying uh, their their meat uh, with uh, the Jewish um, uh, uh, butchers. Uh, after the war, this this is like uh, it, it's gone. Uh, it, like kosher infrastructure. Um, initially, it, it, it's only in the big cities. Nowadays, it's only in Amsterdam. Um, so in that sense, it's it's very uh, uh, reduced. Um, and the post-war um, history of the community is that initially the community is reconstructed mostly according to the pre-war model. Um, so the same infrastructure is is returning. Still, the, the same idea of being Dutch and and uh, and Jewish uh, at, at the same time. Um, is, um, is is of importance uh, to, to a lot of people, um, although this becomes challenged by Zionism. Uh, and Zionism is creating a lot of debates within Jewish communities, uh, for instance, on uh, the pronunciation, pronunciation of Hebrew. Um, yeah, over here in uh, um, uh, Ashkenazi synagogues, the Edemin uh, Hakamakom is to to, to use the, the Western Ashkenazi pronunciation of Hebrew. Um, um, but Zionists uh, wanted to have like the Israeli pronunciation in, in synagogue. Um, so uh, there, there are huge uh, clashes and debates on the pronunciation of Hebrew uh, after the war. Um, and um, uh, it slowly but gradually, uh, Zionists are successful and uh, especially the communities outside of Amsterdam, one after the other, is um, changing from Western Ashkenazi pronunciation to Israeli uh, pronunciation simply because the new generation is is uh, getting training only in in Israeli uh, 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 pronounced uh, Hebrew. Um, um, now, 
this, this is one, one element in, in the post-war history. The other element is that, um, especially since the 1960s, there is a, a process of fragmentation within Dutch Jewry, which means that the unitary orthodox uh, um, uh, community is, is losing rapidly members, um, uh, like a significant pro proportion is becoming secular, um, at least secular in the sense that they are no longer affiliated with the community. Uh, most of many of these people, I would say, have privatized or individualized their Jewish identities. They have some sort of post rabbinic Jewish identity. They do it in their families, uh, um, uh, at home, um, but they don't. They, they they don't need the community and a rabbi anymore uh, for their Jewish identities. Uh, and those people will remain within the. Jewish institutions, um, they, they gradually uh, are um, redefining themselves, um, uh, mostly according to um, the major streams in world Jewry. Um, and so um, uh, Reform Judaism, Reconstructionism, uh, Chabad, um, uh, 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 well, there, there is still uh, um, uh, 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 Mitagdin Litvak, Mitagdin, religious Zionist, Datim Lumim, according to Israeli uh, Musach. Um, um, and of course, there are also still people adhering to the, to the Dutch Jewish, like Mirhak, uh, uh, the, the, the traditions of the, the local tradition. Um, but um, my analysis is that the community, from a very proud self identity uh, as Dutch Jews, um, um, which in a way made them as well some sort of island within the larger Jewish world. Yeah, because in order to keep this, what I consider to be a unique identity, they had to keep foreign influences um, outside the community. But after the war, this is no longer tenable. Um, and um, uh, basically Dutch Jewry becomes a province of world Jewry. And, and like all developments in in America, in Israel, in, in the UK, they directly influence the Jewish community here in the Netherlands as well. And even though it's a tiny community, uh, um, uh, it's still um, like all streams are represented over here. Um, and and, um, and in that sense, um, uh, Amsterdam is uh, still a very dynamic uh, Jewish community and uh, um, with a lot of variety uh, within it. Um, but it's no longer, in that sense, uh, it's no longer a distinct identity, a, a, a very pronounced local identity. Uh, it's it's more ado ad adopted to, to international uh, developments. So this book, uh, I think we mentioned at the beginning, is a new edition, but it's really completely redone, new chapters, newly redone from the old edition, uh, again, Lippmann, uh, Lippmann Library. Um, so... It, it, this is, the book is essentially trying, I mean, kind of what we did here on this episode, trying to give a general scholarly overview from the beginning kind of until today, right? Is that what, what and, and, and also what kind of was changed from the old edition? Yeah. Um, well, um, it, the old edition um, um, was, um, um, it, it, it was at the time, uh, so it, it like, what, what we basically did is to reassess um, the old edition. And we found out that several chapters had to be entirely rewritten. So there are several new chapters in it, and there are several chapters entirely rewritten. Um, so for instance, um, at the, we discussed uh, Jews in, in the colonies. Um, uh, we discussed uh, 18th century Ashkenazi Jewish life. Uh, well, this was barely represented uh, in the edition of 20 years uh, ago. Um, and, and it was really important for us to stress uh, these uh, these new elements. Uh, gender as well is uh, something that um, is taken more serious in this, this edition. Um, and so basically what, what we have done is to bring um, this book, um, uh, in, bring together in this book uh, the present state of, of scholarship, um, uh, including uh, like present tendencies in, in scholarship, uh, the, the spatial turn, uh, um, the, the introduction of uh, digital humanities, um, um, the, the colonial turn, um, uh, also uh, like 
troubling aspects as Jews and slaves for instance, uh, Jews and blackness, um, um, uh, questions of religion and, and secular, secularization. Um, and so uh, it's tuned into the major academic debates in, in Jewish history and in, in history at large. Okay. And all right, what other further reading can you suggest listeners? Obviously, there's a lot, but if people want, there's, there's this book, like I said, a very good general overview, a very good place to start. But if people want specifics on different things that we yeah. discussed or other things, what can you recommend? Well, for, for this reason, uh, uh, it, at the end of the book, we added a bibliography um, with reading suggestions. Um, so for, for each period, for the early modern period, for uh, the 19th century, for the um, uh, 20th century, for contemporary Judaism, and we have lists of, of literature where um, you can, uh, you can, you can um, uh, look for, for additional uh, material. Um, so it, there, there is um, um, a growing body of scholarship um, uh, although uh, there's still so much to do, um, it's still the collections here in Amsterdam uh, of Eitz Chaim, of the Bibliotheca Rosenthaliana, of the, the city archives, uh, the, the, of the Jewish communities here, they are so rich and there's so much material that where no one has ever looked at uh, uh, up until uh, today. Um, so uh, there's still a lot to do, um, uh, but luckily um, uh, more and more scholars uh, both from the Netherlands and from abroad are, are finding their way into, into this field. And, and really, we really hope that this book is a stepping stone for a lot of colleagues and for students to acquaint themselves with the present state of, of research uh, and then continue uh, the research in, in this field. Uh, and um, um, I, I really hope that, that it, it works like that. Okay, one final personal question for you is what are you working on now? Are you working on any new books, any new projects now? Um, well, I, I have several uh, projects uh, going on. Uh, um, one of them is a, a study of the uh, Luchot uh, being uh, published in, in Amsterdam from the 18th century onwards. Beginning of the 18th century, uh, Luchot are, are being published here, which is a, a, a genre of almanacs, including calendars. Um, but um, also prophecies uh, about um, what is going to happen with the weather, for instance, or um, uh, other aspects um, it, it, uh, it, in these little booklets, uh, uh, information about transportation is added, about fares is added. Um, uh, there are um, uh, poems uh, added to it, uh, 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 short chronicle fragments. Um, so it's a very dyna dynamic genre. And um, for me, Luchot uh, is, is one way of um, describing everyday Jewish life because these, these Luchot or in Dutch Yiddish Luchjes, uh, uh, they were like, used by um, the, the very poor people, the common people. Uh, and you can reconstruct on the basis of these luchot their uh, um, their networks, the 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 the, the, the fares they travelled to, their economic networks, um, uh, how they combined living in Christian time and in Jewish time. Um, and so uh, they 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 were switching between times. Uh, um, and they were very well aware. If you, if you see the calendar in in, in this uh, luchot, uh, they there's. The Christian calendar with all the Christian holy days uh, and even the saints days, uh, and there is the Jewish calendar with the Jewish festivals and with the Parashat Shavuot, and, uh, and 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 they um, so it, it gives an, an a way of entrance into um, lived Jewish life in in the early modern uh, period. Um, so that's that's one of the projects I'm uh, I'm working on. Fascinating. Okay, so like I said, I'll put a link in the show's notes to this book, uh, to the reappraising the history of the Jews in the Netherlands, and uh, people can check it out if they're interested in purchasing it and reading it. And thank you much. Thank you very much once again, Professor Vollett, for joining me to discuss the book and the history of the Jews in the Netherlands. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.